Kreuzer, welcome to our RCF online Sunday gathering on the 25th of April 2021. Uh, today, continuing our unquenchable series through the Book of Acts, and this week, today, Andy picks up the baton as we re reach Acts chapter 17, 16 to 34. And Paul arrives in Athens and he continues to engage in the conversation about the gospel. But this time he's dealing with a folk who are not familiar with the backstory of God's good news. They've never read the law and the prophets. They're not familiar with the many promises of the Messiah. But we see Paul meeting them where they were. He's being observant, listening and being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And he's finding the right words and the right ways to bring the gospel alive to his hearers. Communicating the fact that God is not unknown. In fact, he's made himself known through his son, Jesus Christ. He's not distant, but he is close and he wants to be known by those who earnestly seek him. So before we start, what we're going to do is we're just going to pray and ask the Lord would help us and open our eyes, open our ears so that we will be uh, able to work out all that we've heard and seen today by faith. So, Father, I just pray, Lord God, that you would help us today. You would speak to us, Lord God, as we listen to your word, Lord. Uh, I thank you that your word is powerful and it changes us, Lord. So I pray, Lord God, that we would be changed today. And as we press in, as we seek your face, as we as we engage with all the other aspects of this online gathering, I pray, Lord, that you would draw us closer to yourself in the name of Jesus. And I just pray today for anyone out there who is just seeking and doesn't know Jesus for themselves, that they will know that you are not distant, that you are not far away, but you've come close and you're reaching out to them. So Lord, I ask that for each one of those in Jesus name. Amen. And now we're going to have somebody pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Um, so you may know it as the Lord's Prayer, some know it as the Disciples' Prayer, but it's it's very familiar. So just allow those words just to touch your heart this morning. I'll see you later on. Bye-bye. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Hi friends, I've got a question to start with this morning. What really gets your goat? What makes you really cross? What really winds you up? I'll give you a moment or two just to think about that or talk about with that with those who are in the room with you. I wonder what you thought about. Maybe it was very trivial things, things that don't matter very much, or maybe it was things that are quite serious and quite important that affect the whole world. I thought of a few, uh, some of each. Socks and underwear on the floor, maybe. That's something that really annoys you. You think, couldn't they just pick them up and put them in the washing basket? Wonder which members of the family are thinking that now, or thinking, oh, that's me. When people throw litter everywhere, we, I went for a walk this week uh, with Rachel and we looked over one of, the, one of the walls to a field full of sheep and lambs and right the way along, there were discarded bottles and bits of rubbish that people had just thrown over the wall instead of taking home and putting them in, in the bin. Right in the open countryside, that annoys me. I also thought of racism. That makes me really angry, partly because of where I grew up and, uh, and therefore who my friends were as I grew up. Um, but racism is something that, that, that we find all over the world. It's been very much in the news this week with the conviction of, um, of Floyd's killer, hasn't it? So that's one thing that really winds me up. Well, a bit of a recap. Ali spoke last week about Paul in Berea and at the end how Paul had to be sent away for his own safety. Um, and so some of the believers from Berea took him down to Athens. They was heading for the coast um, where eventually he, he got on a boat, but um, he, he, they took him down to Athens and there he was going to wait. He sent a message back with the guys that had escorted him to send Silas and Timothy as soon as they were able to. And Ali uh, <laughs> amazingly managed to say that today we would be having, uh, we would be going to Athens with Andy. So here we are going to Athens with Andy. But first of all, uh, we're going to hear our reading. I'm reading from Acts chapter 17, verses 16 to 34. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day, with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Aerogopus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, stabbing in the midst of Virogopus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the object of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives all to mankind, life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined a lot of periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that that the divine is being like gold or silver or stone, 
an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed. Among them were also Dionysius, the Areogopite, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So Paul wasn't sidelined in Athens. He wasn't just hanging around wondering what to do with himself, nor indeed anywhere else he wound up. Even when in prison years later, um, Paul shared with people about Jesus. Um, there's a hint in the letters to the Philippians about people that were chained to him being stuck with him so that he got to lead them to Jesus. Um, so Paul saw being in Athens as yet another opportunity to do what Paul did, which was to preach the good news. Verse 16 tells us that as he wandered around Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Even today, we know about the Greeks. In fact, some of us will have learned in school about the, the gods that the Greeks worshipped. Um, that's gods with a small g, not real ones. Uh, Zeus and Poseidon and Apollo and Artemis and all the, the others. There were lots and lots of them. Um, Petronius wrote that it was easier to find a god than it was to find a man in Athens. <laughs> there were so many statues and so many shrines and so many temples. Even today, um, tourists still go to Athens to see the Parthenon, the temple to Athena, and the Acropolis, which is dedicated to Roma. Uh, there was so much of this um, pagan worship that it really wound Paul up. Well, what about idols today? Of course, we know that there are still statues and there are still images of other gods in world religions, Buddha and Krishna and Brahma and, um, uh, and, and many, many more. And there are temples and mosques and so forth dedicated to the worship of other gods, as well as the occult stuff, the New Age stuff and the superstitions and astrology and crystals and tarot readers and holistic healers and all of that garbage. How does that make you feel? Angry? Sad? Disappointed? Maybe threatened? Well, we have no need to feel threatened. Remember, we have the truth. Psalm 96 and verse 5 says, For all the gods of the nations are idols, for the Lord made the heavens. What about idols, though, that are closer to home? Hmm. Consumerism. Comfortability. Money. Career success. Position. Status. Authority. Influence. Or maybe things like the TV, food, sports teams, leisure pastimes, my rights. They're not bad things necessarily in themselves, but anything that we value higher than God, and an easy measure of that is how much time you spend on it compared with how much time you go over to God, becomes an idol for us. Our God, the Bible tells us, is a jealous God. And so when something becomes an idol, he demands that we put it aside and we follow him. In 1919, uh, sorry, 1904-5, Evan Roberts, writing to his brother, said, anything in your life that you're not sure about, whether it's in the right place or not, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, anything that you're not sure about, put it to one side. Why would he write that? Because you don't want it to be in the way of you and God because what you have in God is so much better. Back to Paul. He has a good look round Athens and uh, he looks for opportunities to tell people about Jesus. And he finds two key places in the city. First of all, we're told that he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons. And the word reason that's used here is about patient, ongoing persuasion. It's not a one-off evangelistic event or preach. It's a day after day, 
consistent living alongside, being there with people, asking questions, debate kind of uh, reasoning out. Um, and that's necessary, isn't it, when we're sharing our faith with people because people have questions. Urban Saints describe um, our groups as liminal spaces, places of discovery, places of exploration. It's not somewhere where young people come and we tell them, this is the truth and you have to believe it. But it's somewhere we come and we can present what we believe is the truth, but they can ask questions and they can explore it and they can disagree. And, and we can have that reasoning that goes on. The second place that Paul went was the marketplace, not the place where religious people hung out, but those where the, the ordinary everyday people were. Archaeologists tell us that the marketplace was probably the Roman Forum. Um, it was a place surrounded by colonnades, including, well, they called them stoas, the Stoa of Atalas, which has been reconstructed today so that people can have some idea of what it, what it was like. And as Paul reasons with the people, he, um, in the marketplace, he attracts, not surprisingly, two groups of philosophers, not one, but two. Um, and they're actually opposing philosophies, so it's uh, always going to be good for an argument. And these were the Stoics, who were really into human virtues, including wisdom and courage and justice and moderation. We might, I suppose, compare them in some ways with secular humanists today. The second group, who are quite different, were the Epicureans. They were disciples of Epicurus, and they were really into sensual enjoyment. Quite different from the, uh, the Stoics. So these opposing philosophers, not surprisingly, couldn't agree. Um, in fact, neither, neither group agreed with what Paul was preaching. So they took him and they brought him to the Areopagus, Areopagus we're told in verse 19. The Areopagus um, was two, uh, means two things, of course. It was the Hill of Ares, that's how it comes to be called that. In other words, it was a place dedicated to a pagan god. But the, when we read it here in verse 19, it also refers to a gathering place or a, 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 a body that gathered there, a long established body which governed civil, civil and religious life in Athens. It was there where, they, where uh, the people that gathered who thought they were clever or important and influential, and they gathered there to hear and to pass judgment on the latest new ideas. Verse 21 tells us they loved anything new and they spent lots and lots of time on it. So here's Paul at the heart of this hotbed of reason and debate. Great opportunity. How does he start? Well, he doesn't start by going, you know all that stuff you do, it's wrong. He doesn't condemn them. That's not how he begins at all. He starts in a slightly different way. Verse 22 says, he starts by saying this, I perceive that in every way you are religious. Well, now they're on side. Okay, now they'll listen because he's flattering them, he's appealing to them, and he's inviting them to think. And then in verse 23, he finds a point of contact. He finds a key, if you like, that will unlock some of the arguments. As he's wandered around town, he's noticed that they've got an altar which is inscribed as being to an unknown God. <laughs> I guess they were hedging their bets, you know. <laughs> um, in case we've missed any gods in all the ones that we've, we've set up temples and statues to, um, we'll set up ones of the ones that we might have missed <laughs> and uh, hopefully we'll have covered everything. Um, perhaps it's a bit like Hinduism or Baha'i today. <laughs> Or maybe they were just looking for something that was real. Um, you know, maybe in the back of some of their minds, they, they realised that some of this stuff was just lumps of stone. So we'll go for something else that we don't really understand yet. We'll erect a statue to that. Like a bit like people today who, who try out Eastern religion or New Age stuff in order to find themselves. And Paul continues, what you worship as an unknown God that's what I've come to tell you about. It's that I proclaim to you. At this point, I reckon the people in the Areopagus were on the edge of their seats. Go on then. Tell us, Paul. Tell us. Well, he starts by clearly outlining the superiority of God. He describes God as the one who made the world and everything in it, as opposed to their man-made gods. 
he's now starting to upset some people. Some people are going to be offended by what he's saying. If we share our faith with people, I guarantee some will be upset or annoyed. I remember uh, taking a school assembly in a school up in Cumbria and uh, I made a particular statement about um, the Big Bang Theory followed by evolution. And uh, and all I was doing was was just carefully, because I chose my words very carefully, explaining that this was a theory, not a proven fact end to end, or a set of proven facts. Um, I was almost pinned to the wall by the head of science in the staff room, uh, immediately following my assembly, as he, in front of the rest of the staff team, shouted at me uh, and told me how offended he was. It was great, actually, because it began a debate that continued pretty much every time I went into school after that. It was great. We had that reasoning that we've already referred to. And so when we tell people about, about God, some people will be upset. For some people, the gospel is offensive, not least because it points out that they were wrong, that we were wrong. Well, in for a penny, in for a pound, Paul continues, God doesn't live in temples made by man. Oh, oh, like the ones you've got all over the place that you can love to build. Now he's upsetting, by the way, the Jewish hearers too. Not even just the Greeks, but the Jews too. But this is, all going to, this is also going to upset people in Athens because the whole economy of their city is built around people coming to, their, to see what it is that they've built, their pagan culture and their places of worship. They're making a lot of money out of this. They're making a good living at this. And Paul's saying, actually, do you know what? God doesn't live in that. The real God, not those, doesn't live in that stuff. And then he continues, uh, perhaps gets even more offensive, saying, by the way, he doesn't need you either. Um, because God is the one who gives life and breath to all mankind. In other words, he's not impressed by your religious practices. He doesn't need them. He doesn't want them. I know, by the way, there's a truth here. God doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need us. He is a sovereign God. He has existed since before the beginning of all things. Um, one God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He doesn't have need of us. But he created us and he chooses us. That's a privilege. That he chooses us to be in relationship with him and he chooses us to serve him. He doesn't need us to. He could accomplish it. We read in Esther, um, she's told, you know, if you don't do it, God will accomplish it in some other way because he can, because he's God. But he chooses us. Back to Paul. In verse 26, he goes on to explain how God has established all mankind, every nation through Adam, and given them their allotted time periods when they're going to be on the earth and the boundaries of their dwelling places. That sounds like nations, doesn't it? And then comes the crunch as Paul explains to them, why has God done all this stuff? Why has God made all this stuff? Why is it that he's put people in their places for specific periods of time? And in verse 27, we read that he says that God has done this in order that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way towards him and find him. God's very purpose in making mankind, in making you and me, in making everyone we will ever meet, is to be in a relationship with him, to be in a friendship with him. Oh, and by the way, he tells the Athenians, God is actually not far from each and every one of us. Now Paul quotes some of their own poets. It's actually a quote um, from a, a hymn that's written to their God Zeus. And by, by kind of using that and referring it to God, it's almost like Paul is, is offending them even more. He's sweeping aside Zeus, one of the most important of their gods, and he replaces Zeus with God, our God. And he declares of our God, we are his offspring, we are his children. Now think about this for a moment. If you follow the logic of what Paul has said, if we are God's children, his offspring, then he cannot be some man-made idol that we made out of a rock that we carved or a tree that we carved. And Paul refers to these things as ignorance. 
and he calls on the people there in the Areopagus to repent, to turn around. Note the word repent is, is different from, it doesn't mean, or oh, just tinker a bit, mess about with it, with the stuff you've been doing and change little bits of it so it's sort of acceptable. Because the world's ways and God's ways are completely different. They're completely, they're often completely opposite. And so Paul calls them to turn round from the way they've been going, worshipping lumps of stone and bits of wood, to turn round so they've now got their back to that and come and worship God. Just as, Paul, as, God, as God, God invites us to turn away from the things that we have in our lives as idols and to turn back instead to serve him. Then Paul um, finishes to talk about, but finishes by talking about the, the coming judgment by Jesus. And he points out that Jesus is worthy to judge as God has raised him from the dead. Paul isn't just content to talk to them about their religious practices and how wrong they are. He's determined that in every conversation, he's going to tell them about Jesus. He would later write to Timothy um, in, in 2 Timothy 4, um, or what we have as 2 Timothy 4, in the presence of God and Christ Jesus Timothy, who will judge the living and the dead. And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge, preach the word. And that word there is logos. It's the same word that's used in, in Greek in, in John chapter one, in the beginning was the word. And so Paul says to Timothy, preach the word, preach Jesus, be prepared in season and out of season. In other words, what he's saying to him is, uh, Timothy, tell him about Jesus, whether it seems like the right time or not, tell him about Jesus, because that's what they need to know. And that's what Paul does. And how do the Athenians respond? <laughs> Usual mixed response. We will all encounter all of these things when we tell people about Jesus. Some rejected the message and they rejected Paul. Some were interested, sort of, but they got questions. They wanted to hear more. That's OK. And some believed straight away. Some important people actually tells us. So what do we learn from all this? Let's recap a little bit. Examine and understand the culture around you. Don't hide from it, don't be scared by it, but don't join in with it. Secondly, look for opportunities to step in and to share truth. You know, sometimes there are triggers, aren't there? People have conversations about spirituality or death or hope or superstition. You know, and we're on the fringes of those conversations. They give us an opportunity to share truth with people. It's an obvious starting point. When people tell us, I'm just full of despair, we have an opportunity to share hope with them. Thirdly, as we do that, don't condemn. That's God's job. Find points of connection. John 3, verse 17. Ooh, how many times do we hear that one? We hear John 3, 16 a lot. But in John 3, 17, Jesus says of himself, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. He hasn't come to condemn. He's come to draw people to himself. That's his purpose. If he was about condemnation, he'd have put a stop to all our nonsense long ago. But he's patient, giving us a chance. Fourthly, know and understand from study the scriptures so that you can reason with people. Ali spoke more about that last week, didn't she? And, and lastly, and perhaps most important of all, wherever else, tell them about Jesus. Like Paul wrote to Tim, Tim, tell them about Jesus, whether it seems like the right time or not. Tell people about Jesus. Don't tell them about the church. Don't tell them how nice the preacher is or, the, the, or isn't. Um, don't tell them how good the band are or any of that stuff, tell them about Jesus, because none of the rest of it is going to see um, any, any significant eternal difference in people's lives. But relationship with God through Jesus changes everything. Let's pray. Father God, we bless you for your church from its very beginnings, way back in the book of Acts, unquenchably continuing right through to today. 
thank you that many of the same things that Paul encountered there in, in the Areopagus in Athens, we will encounter today. Thank you that we have opportunity to learn from him, to understand the culture around us, to look for opportunities to step in and share truth and to talk about Jesus. Lord, will you prompt us by your spirit, show us where those opportunities are during this coming week and use us to draw people to turn to you or maybe as a first step, just to reason. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome back. I really hope that you enjoyed what you saw and heard. But more than that, I hope that it helped you grow in your understanding of who Jesus is and gave you a desire to really, really press in and know him more. Uh, just like to thank everybody who 
um, took part and uh, everybody who shared their contributions with us. It, we, we really do appreciate it. Uh, this week, please join us to pray for our communities on Tuesday mornings at 11 a.m. You know, we're praying according to the words of Jesus in Luke 10, 2 and 3. Jesus said to the disciples, he said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. And then he said, go, I'm sending you out like lambs amongst wolves. So we're praying that God would send workers into his harvest field here in North Wales. The message puts it this way. What a huge harvest and how few are the harvest hands. So on your knees, ask the God of the harvest to send harvest hands on your way. But be careful. This is hazardous work. You're like lambs in a wolf pack. You know, join us as we pray for your communities and the many communities around North Wales. And this week, we're going to focus particularly on Corwen. So if you want to join us, contact us and we will send you a Zoom link. Keep on practicing your missional rhythms, bells, blessing, eating, listening, learning and sending. And let us know how you're getting on. Send us your stories. Let's pray now just to close. We're going to pray our, our regular RCF prayer. Make us a church without walls where Jesus Christ is the core of everything that we do. Teach us how to love people better. Help us to make disciples. Holy Spirit, equip us for reviving faith in our own communities. Keep us growing and maturing in you. Amen. And now we're going to say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the fellow Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Bless you all. And next week we will have our all sorts, all age gatherings. So please join us then. Bye for now. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. Lord smile on you. May he be gracious and show you his favor, giving you his peace. The peace that brings his love so near and dry all fear away the peace that helps our hearts be still this is why we pray may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you Show you his favor, give.